And so she spent years uh, pioneering a path for youth, speaking, facilitating workshops, traveling the U.S. and the world, speaking at gatherings. Um, and I remember the first time I saw her, I was blown away. I was like, how does a 16-year-old know anything, let alone my life and how I should fix it? Uh, so um, I, have, I fell in love with her then, and it's just been a love affair that's developed for me over the last 15 years. She has served on the National Youth Council, on the Visioning Corps. We served together on the International Youth and Family Ministries. She's attended youth camps for 10 years. She's spoken to study groups in London and Cairo and has been working with our Science of Mind community in the Ukraine. Speaking of the Ukraine, I want to welcome uh, my new best friend who's joining us from the Ukraine today. <laughs> See, like, we're so delighted. You have to meet this young man. He's delightful. Uh, he got to learn Science of Mind because he was the translator. And it's for our, our, for our wonderful Reverend Savannah and Reverend Barbara. And so, you know, when you have to say all the words, you begin to learn it. And so he's pretty, he's pretty good, I've got to say. So my friend lived in Egypt in 2012 during the revolution. And so she was at that time pursuing her passion for global ministry. She returned in the Ukraine in the fall of 2012 to teach classes and paneled 11 new Ukrainian practitioners. I want you to know that one part of our tithe goes to support that work in the Ukraine, and it's a beautiful thing. This past September, she returned to the Ukraine again, where she co-led an annual peace conference amidst the current conflict going on there. So she re recently received her master's in consciousness studies with the Holmes Institute in Denver, and is currently the youngest minister in the Centers for Spiritual Living. She was on the cover of the February 2015 Science of Mind magazine, which featured her article, The Sacred Amidst the Shadow, which she'll speak of today in her workshop this afternoon. Her passion is to be a bridge amongst peoples of diverse cultures and regions globally, inspiring social change, tools for development, and the elevation of love consciousness on the planet. So it is my distinct honor, I've been working on this for about a year, to finally get to introduce my friend to the rest of my friends. Please welcome Reverend Savannah Riker. Good morning. So um, before I get started here, have you ever had an experience where you're focused on something and there was something back here nagging on you that you had to do that you just couldn't stop thinking about it until you did it? Well, in this moment, it just dawned on me that my purse is in the back row. Could someone <laughs> grab my purse? I believe it's in the back row, and I would love it. Uh, Vitalik, if you could. Thank you. It's just one of those things, right? You have so many details going on. Oh, wow, that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Reverend Marty. Um, I am honored to be here. If I can get this. Oh, no, 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 I don't need it up here. I just, just <laughs> hold it secure. <laughs> He's like, we were saying, he's like my Sherpa over there. I've known Vitalik for 11 years. He was one of my first young adults in Ukraine back in 2004. So thank you. It's amazing to be here. Um, as he said, I, we met each other at Youth and Family Ministries uh, years ago, 16 years old. And um, it's fascinating to watch your mentors and your ministers at that age and then to see it come full circle now. It's just, it's really powerful. And uh, also, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you from our spiritual community, Temenos in Ukraine, Reverend Barbara, for your tithe, for all the work um, that we're doing in Ukraine. It's incredible how much this community and other communities supporting Ukraine of what's actually possible there, especially right now. So thank you. And also, I have to tell you that this is the first city on my tour. So I just started my first speaking tour and I'm going to be headed to Southern California soon, and this happens to be the first city. So that's kind of exciting to say, Salt Lake City. <clears throat> yeah, let's talk for that. <laughs> so my topic today is the sacred amidst the shadows. And um, as Marty just pointed out, I was on my way to Ukraine um, this past September, kind of at the very last minute. Our minister there, Reverend Barbara Leger, came to me a week before her conference, and she said, Savannah, I have an emergency. I need you to go fill in for me at this conference. And 
I had just moved to the Bay Area in San Francisco, and I said, are you kidding? Like, your conference is in a week. And she said, I know, but I can't be there. I have to uh, stay at home, and um, you know my culture and the community well enough. I think that, you know, I, we could do this. And I hesitantly said, okay. And I'm not all, as Marty was speaking to, I'm not unfamiliar to revolution. But this one was just like, I don't know if I'm ready for this, because for one, I didn't know what was really happening there, and I didn't know what was going on on the ground, if it was serious, and I had no idea what I was walking into. But I said yes, and as life would have it, everything worked for my good to get me there uh, five days before this conference. And so I arrived at SFO on a the airport, and this couple before me had just gotten their boarding passes, and the, the gate checker guy says, well, enjoy your trip to Hawaii, and they start to proceed off, and he looks at my boarding pass, and he says, are you sure you want to go there? <laughs> Ukraine, are you sure? And I said, please don't. I, I got myself to the airport. Do not try to talk me out of this. I am going to Ukraine. I'm getting on that plane. And so I'm going to share a little bit later what that experience was like and what ended up happening once I got there. But I want to to bring our attention to the current events of what's actually happening on the planet right now. The sacred amidst the shadow and why I, I chose this topic uh, that I feel is so vital and important is because we look at the world of effect right now. We look at what's going on in the news, the current flooding that happened in Texas recently, uh, the climate change and what's happening on the planet, the, the earthquake in Nepal. We look at the riots and the demonstrations and the protests in Baltimore, and I see them in Oakland, where I live. And all of this shadow, all of this opportunity, I would say, for us to look at the macro, to see what's happening out in the world as a reflection of what's really going on within us. Because I have a belief that our vibration matters, that we are all connected to each other, and so what's happening out there in the world of effect, in the external, is, is just a reflection of what's going on within us. And we have the power to change that. So I, I feel like we're going through life walking around as some of us, as these wounded triggers. You know, you meet people, uh, maybe in your circle, who are triggered by this or that. And um, what happens is, is that when we don't look at those dark aspects or the things underneath what's really going on, then we look at the, there's blame, there's shame, there's depression, then, then the things like that tend to come out sideways because the light hasn't been brought to them. So the question is, how do we embrace the shadow when it's on our doorstep? How do we embrace the darkness? If you're going through a difficult or challenging time, how do we embrace the shadow and learn to integrate it into our wholeness? The definition of a shadow is a dark area or shape produced by a body coming between rays of light and a surface. Have any of you seen that National Geographic uh, photograph that's been circula circulating of the camels in Saudi Arabia? Yes. So what it is is it's this, this image of these camels like all across the desert, and all you see are these black, huge shadows. And if you look long enough, you realize that what you're looking at is just the shadow, the camel itself, or like tiny little white light on the image. And I looked at this and thought, wow, this, this is a really cool metaphor for what I'm speaking about. I think that, for me, the shadow is the hidden aspects of ourselves. It's the part of ourselves that we've disowned. It's the part of ourselves we really don't want other people to know about. We don't want people to see Maybe it's the part of ourselves that we don't like. And again, when we don't really look at that stuff, it can come out sideways in all kinds of ways. And so many of us question, where was God? Where is God in my life when we're going through something difficult? Many of us looking outside to the external world to make us okay. Sometimes that looks like addiction. Sometimes that looks like an unhealthy relationship that we're in that we know we shouldn't be in. There's something within us that just knows that it doesn't feel right. Or maybe you're at a job that you hate, and it's really difficult to speak up about how you really feel. There's a lot of underlying stuff there. 
But to shift, we have to look at the shadow. We have to look at it right in the face. And that's the fun part, right? <laughs> that's the interesting part. Dr. Darren Weissman says that emotions transform energy. Energy causes movement, movement is change, and change is the essence of life. The more we embrace and create change, the more we are in the flow of the universe. And so we really owe it to ourselves to look at that stuff. So I'm on the plane, headed to Ukraine, and I get to Switzerland, and uh, at that point, you know, in the world travel, you're kind of delirious because you've been up all night and you've had no sleep. I Many of you probably know this if you've traveled the world. And so I'm on the plane, and I have maybe a four-hour flight, and it dawns on me as the doors close that the plane is half empty, if not more. And I'm like, there's no turning back now. It was like this really eerie feeling, and I've never had this feeling on a plane. Actually, the only time I had this feeling was my first trip to Egypt. It was just this really just uncomfortable, eerie feeling. And I sat there and went into panic. Went into panic, like, what are you doing? The, the plane is half empty. You're the only American on this plane. Everyone else is Ukrainian, and um, most people are leaving. Like, well, nobody's coming into Ukraine. And so that's when I really got to look at what I teach. I got to look at my faith and what it's founded upon. And I started to pray. And I realized at that point, when you're on a plane, you can't get off, right? I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no turning back. So I get to just choose to be in a prayerful place. So that's where I went. And I got there, and I was greeted by an old friend, an old taxi driver friend of mine, Slavic. And he took me there, and we went into the conference, uh, which was actually in the woods. It was like in a wooded area. And on one of the evenings there, I was asked to lead a process that we've done for many years that a lot of our youth do at our camps here. And it's a nurturing process called AB Love. And basically what it is, is it's a process of giving and receiving love unconditionally. So you have a group of people, some people in the, in the center of the circle, and they have their eyes closed and their hands down. And then you have another group of people who come up and they love them and they nurture them and they say you know, incredible things to them. And this took 10 years for me to actually bring a process like this to Ukraine because when we first tried to do it, people were like, mm, I don't want to be touched. So, you know, people can't love each other like this. And so in this community, we have learned to really embrace this process and people have seen it as a transformational tool. So on the evening of one of the, the days of the conference, we started this process and we had candles all on the on the ground and it was dark and halfway through this process i look up in the distance and i see these people walking towards us and i'm thinking oh gosh this is like a public event what's going to happen here and it was the most amazing thing uh, there were maybe five to ten people who came in and they had these little ones who came into our circle, had no idea what we were doing, but they could feel the vibration and the energy of what we had created. And so they came in and they just put their hands down, eyes closed, wanting to feel the love. These were refugees and displaced families from eastern Ukraine who had, who had been staying there while the conflict was going on. And so what, what looked like a really dark, crazy, scary situation turned out to be something so incredible and beautiful, and I got to hear some of their stories. And then I realized that I was absolutely there on divine appointment, that nothing is wasted, that nothing in your life is unused, that every single thing we do prepares us for the next thing. And not only that, I remember sitting on the beach with Vitalik uh, on the Dnieper River, and it was so funny. We looked at each other, and he said, can you believe that there's actually a war going on right now? Because it was so calm and peaceful. <clears throat> yeah. So the other thing that allows us to embrace the shadow is that we see darkness as a gift. So rather than seeing the, the difficulty and the challenge as something so hard, we can see it as a gift. And sometimes when we're right in the middle of it, it's not easy, is it? To see how this is serving us, how the situation is serving us. But I really believe that the dark stuff is like this creative soil that is wanting us to transform, that's wanting us to bring light to it so that we can heal and that, so that we can remember our wholeness. So when the magazine came out, um, 
that was just another example of how a dark situation in Egypt turned into some, something really incredible, and I finally get to quote myself for the first time. So, <laughs> it's pretty cool. So from the article, we must trust the creativity of the darkness, the holy unknown places, for they bear rich fruit when we've released our attachment to the way that things must be. So back in 2012, I was living in Egypt at a really difficult time. I don't know what it is about revolution in me. It's just like this light, again, that just wants to burst forth into the dark places. And I recall being in a lot of pain and anger and aggression because there was so much going on around me. It was scary to leave my apartment because of the demonstrations and the guns and the tanks and all of that war stuff. And I recall the guy that I had been with, my beloved at the time, uh, was like, Savannah, what is wrong with you? Like, what is going on with you? And he got to see the rage and the anger that I never knew existed in me. But it took that kind of, it, it took that kind of um, experience to pull all the distractions away. It took being out in the world for me to really see myself and see this stuff within myself, even after years of practitioner training and, and work in this philosophy, to really see that I still had stuff to work on, to see that I had, still had some anger. And it took that experience to reflect back to me all of the stuff that was actually going on in the inside. So Egypt was just, again, a reflection. <clears throat> the third thing is, is that we embrace the shadow by surrendering to love. From the magazine, I said that for all of us, we are always getting the opportunity to surrender moment by moment to the presence, to love itself, to something greater than we can rationalize or think of. We all have blind spots, but when we do the work, it's really important. Can we see ourselves in these moments? And can we be gentle with ourselves? The other thing is building our faith muscles. What is our solid foundation? What I've realized uh, in my own practice is that when I feel off or misaligned, it's because I'm not uh, coming back to myself. It's a practice, moment by moment, surrendering to the presence of love itself, surrendering to something greater for my life that wants to happen, even in the midst of the dark stuff. It's like that silver lining that wants us, wants us to go there, that's waiting to happen, to spring forth. And so what is your spiritual practice? What, it, what are the things that bring you back to remembering who you are and whose you are? Who you are as a divine expression of love itself, here to give your gifts and your talents and your joys, and whose you are as the divine itself, this one life, this one intelligence that is so seeking to express itself as my life and your life. What is it and what quality is it that helps you build your faith? What quality is it within you that allows you or, or is asking of you to cultivate for you to remember who you are? For me, it is a trust. It is just this faith that there's something within me that knows even in the midst of a rough situation, that there's something pulling me to grow, that there's something when I'm willing to have the courage to look at it and see it right in the face, that, it, that there's a gift there for me. So I have this mantra. The mantra is I put my attention where I want my life to be. And um, when you have this inner turmoil, it's important to ask yourself, where is my attention? Where am I focusing? We understand in this teaching that where we put our attention is what grows. And so when you're having a difficult experience, how are you framing that story? How are you framing that experience? Where is your focus and your intention? Is it on the good and the gift and the opportunity of ways in which you could grow, of ways that you could deepen your consciousness and your faith? Or is it on the fear and the lack and the scarcity? Again, the world of effect has a way of really um, bringing us and pulling us to, to fear and to worry and to doubt. And so what is it that pulls you back? Ernest Holmes says that thought, which is built upon a realization of the divine presence, has the power to neutralize negative thought, to erase it, just as the light has the power to overcome darkness not by combating darkness, but by being exactly what it is, light. And in the Bible it says, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So we need both. 
And sometimes in this teaching, I don't know how often we really address the shadow. We teach that we turn from the condition and we focus on the truth with a capital T. And I do agree with that, and I also will take it a step further in saying that, hmm, this is debatable. I take it a step further in saying that we can deny the condition. We don't deny that it exists. It's like, okay, I'm having this really rocky situation happening right now. I'm going through this, this, this health challenge right now but I'm going to take my attention off of it, and I'm going, to, I'm going to know wholeness, but I'm not going to give that as all the energy. So it's really about the energy we give it. Again, the perception, the attention of where is my attention. And so I offer you to be compassionate with yourself, to be kind to yourself, to look at what your spiritual practice is, what is it that brings you back to, to realizing your oneness with life. And what is your self-care? How do you care for yourself? I have this story. Um, how many of you remember as kids, um, or I do, I remember as a kid, the story of the Velveteen Rabbit? Yeah, it's a warm story. I see smiles because it's such a sweet story. So the Velveteen Rabbit was this stuffed rabbit who wanted to become real. And uh, he was given to this little boy for Christmas, and he was playing with all his mechanical toys, but none of his, uh, his other toys. And so this rabbit desperately wanted to be real, and there was this other toy there called the skin horse. And the skin horse said to the Velveteen Rabbit one day, he said, real isn't how you are made. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not to just play with, but really loves you, you become real. It doesn't happen all at once. You become it takes a long time, and that's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints, and you look very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't really be ugly except to people who don't understand. And so the Velveteen Rabbit was like, but it's impossible for me to be real. And so eventually, the boy gave, the boy's nana gave him the rabbit to sleep with one night. And it actually became his favorite toy. But then, the boy became very sick with scarlet fever, so they had to move him to the seaside, and they were going to take all his toys and disinfect them and get rid of them. And so the velveteen rabbit was taken into this pack, and he was put out into the garden. And he said, well, now I'll never be real. And so he be began to cry. And the tear dropped into the earth, and out of the earth came this beautiful fairy. And she said, Little rabbit, don't you know who I am? I'm the nursery magic fairy, she said. I take care of all the playthings that the children have loved. When they are old and worn out and the children don't need them anymore, then I come and take them away with me, and I turn them into real. And he says, Well, but wasn't I real before? And she says, You were real to the boy because he loved you. Now you shall be real to everyone. So I love this story. I love this story because it really asks us the question, how much do we love ourselves? How real are we with ourselves? How honest are we with ourselves? How authentic do we express ourselves? When we get real with the places within us that don't work, when we get real with them and we, we learn to bring the light into them, into that space, we can transform them, transform them for healing and for beauty. So my call to action for you today is to be the light in your own life, to be gentle and kind with yourself if you're going through something difficult or challenging, and to not be afraid of the dark, because that is where the real stuff is. That's where the real growth is. That's where uh, the real opportunity lies. And so in closing, this quote from the magazine is, when we are able to meet people right where they are, standing in truth and love, harmony, freedom, tolerance, and acceptance, we will move the world with our conviction of love and radiance. When we have truly seen the underbelly of a culture, its darkness and its light, the places where it must grow, shift, and change, just as these places must within ourselves, I truly believe we have become global citizens. So let us just turn within for a moment.
Closing your eyes, allowing yourself to breathe into the stillness of this life. Remembering that there is really only one thing going on and that is the activity of life itself. Of peace, of harmony, of goodness, of love. That is so seeking to express itself as my life and as every single life in this room that we are forever and ever connected to this source. It never, ever runs out. And what I know in this moment is that we are nurtured and guided and supported in every endeavor, in every way possible and imaginable in our lives. That whatever it is that we are seeking to know, to believe, to heal, to transform, that it is already happening and taking place here in this moment. That we simply turn our attention to it and we allow the presence of love to bask us in it knowing that ease and grace is the natural order of our lives, knowing that the fear and the worry and the doubt and the scarcity and the lack is absolutely not part of our awareness. We release it and we let it go, embracing the love and the joy and the harmony that is my life and that is all of our lives here today. We walk in the light. We walk in the joy. We walk in the goodness that life is bringing to us right now. And so with gratitude in my heart for these words and for every single thought or prayer request that you may have in your heart this day, whatever it is that you may be experiencing in this moment, I know that the love of pure spirit bathes you, that comforts you, that nurtures you right here and right now, giving gratitude for this prayer and these words and for life itself. I give thanks and know it is so. And so it is. Amen.